Well, the latest Wolfenstein game is here, Wolfenstein Youngblood, the fourth game in the series since machine games took over the reins way back in the colonial times of 2014. However, Youngblood's also been co-developed with Arcane Studios, the developers of the Dishonored and the Prey games. And seeing these two devs coming together is like watching Arnie and Carl Weathers giving each other that oily handshake at the start of Predator. For the first time in this series though, you're not playing as everyone's favourite Nazi killer, BJ Blazkowicz. And you're not alone either, this time you're killing Nazis with a friend, playing as one of BJ's twin daughters, either Jess or Soph. <laughs> Fuck yeah! <laughs> and the game also takes place in the 1980s, because 80s culture is more popular right now than deodorant is at a speedrunning event. So let's get psyched and see how the whole thing turned out then, shall we? Right, so Wolfenstein Youngblood takes place 20 or so years after the events in New Colossus, where BJ and his resistance buddies succeeded in clearing the Nazis out of America and liberating the entire country. Good for them. With the death of Frau Engel, there's no longer anyone to really keep the troops rallied. So some sense of normalcy has resumed, with returning character Grace Walker now leading the FBI, because at this point there wasn't really anyone else left alive who could still do it. Yeah. In the intro though, we find out that for some reason, BJ has gone missing, and it's up to his two twin daughters, Jess and Soph, to find him. Well look, it's not really up to them, but the premise of heading into Nazi-occupied Paris with basically no combat training or world experience somehow sounds like a good idea to them. So that's what they do. Along the way, they'll help out the French resistance, move through the Paris underground and catacombs, and of course, kill lots of Nazis. So unsurprisingly, this is a pretty damn good looking game. The id Tech 6 engine has just been put to really good use here, with fantastic environmental detail, highly detailed weapon and character models, mostly, and just a really appealing art style. It's kind of weird though that the 80s still pretty much turned out the same way it did, even though it's set in an alternate history where the Nazis won the Second World War. But you can see they've tried to modify things a little bit to fit in with the fact that the past 40 years have played out a lot different. But the premise is really just window dressing, it's the gameplay that matters the most. Now gameplay wise, not much has really been changed from New Colossus. You'll be using mostly the same guns, albeit slightly updated to suit the time period, along with a few new ones. And you've got mostly the same mechanics, like double jumping, sliding, and all that kind of stuff. Here you go, dude. After a couple of introductory missions, which serve as a bit of a tutorial for how these mechanics work, you meet up with the French Resistance and have to start tracking down your old man. And this is where things start to open up a bit. Now you've got access to the Paris Catacombs, which serve as your base of operations and the current Resistance headquarters. From here you can collect missions from NPCs, which send you to about half a dozen or so different sections of Paris. Nazi patrols are everywhere. When you're moving through these areas, you're able to go with a stealth or a combat approach when engaging enemies. And it kind of reminds me a bit of moving through Eisenstadt in Raven Software's 2009 Wolfenstein. That game also had a very similar setting and it was a like to in the way that it puts you in this occupied area and then kind of let you choose how you wanted to move through that environment and engage your enemies. It's also got that Far Cry 2 vibe in the way that these assholes are going to respawn every single time you move back through that area. Yeah, all of them, even the big ones. And then it's also very similar to Dishonored, how you can move through these back streets to avoid enemy patrols, or cut straight through someone's apartment as a shortcut. This is where you see the Arcane Studios influence coming in, and some of these areas look like they've been ripped right out of the streets of Dunwall. It's a shame though that unlike Dishonored, you can't interact with other citizens. You're just kind of limited to the squads of enemies that are trying to kill you. Paris is a very empty city, and it's a shame they didn't explore the effect the Resistance has been having on other people. The city just serves as a backdrop and a sandbox to how you want to tackle all of these missions, and yeah, look, running around the place and jumping through windows, ambushing patrols and killing things is pretty fun. Mobility is really good too, you've got that double jump, you can vault over walls and clamber up ledges. You can even dash to the side with an upgrade and slide across the ground. Moving around with dual machine pistols and mowing down guys in a flash is some of the most satisfying gunplay, I think, in the entire series. and you're constantly upgrading your weapons with coins that you find throughout the environment and in crates. Each weapon has three separate upgrade trees which affect things like the fire rate, DPS and magazine capacity. So you're always on the lookout for coins here, like a bogan at a bus stop. 
The problem is though, is that this is all you're really gonna be doing the entire game. Now the main goal is to take out three giant robots that control the access to some kind of super secret tower. And it's believed that once you reach this tower, it's gonna help you locate where BJ is. But to take on these robots, you first need to be a high enough level, and to be a high enough level, you need to level up. You do this by killing lots of enemies and completing other side missions in the various sections of the city. Got the bug in place, Abby. Well done, girls. It's kind of similar to what they did recently in Rage 2, where the bulk majority of the campaign was the grinding element to get to the next story mission. Far Cry New Dawn also did a similar thing, and even The Division 2 was guilty of this to an extent. I mean, if you could just go right to these robots from the get-go, there'd be no point to playing the other side missions. So it's really just a way of padding the game's length out, but also giving you a sense of progression. What they're doing is putting a number on something and forcing a certain requirement of the player before you can finish it. But once you reach that necessary level, you're still gonna take on the enemies the exact same way. It's just a prerequisite to getting there. Doesn't really matter who you play as either because both girls can use the exact same weapons and they both have access to the same skill set. About all it changes is their appearance. Both girls get access to a cloaking device, which when upgraded makes it really easier to sneak past enemies. Then you've got the ramshackles returning from the new Colossus, where you can shove into enemies and either kill them or knock them on their ass. Then there's one more power that you get right before the end of the game, which is necessary for a single boss fight, but then it's never really needed ever again. It would have been cool if they had have made Jess the stealthier option and so like a brawler or something. Like it could have made the combat a bit more dynamic and open-ended. As a result, you both use the same guns, the same attachments, the same skills, and you level up the same way. Oh yeah, Youngblood has a leveling system. So obviously the girls aren't exactly the hardened seasoned Nazi killers that their dad was. So they're going to be a bit sloppy at things to begin with. In fact, you get to see their very first kill ever in game. So you start off at level 1, and as you level up, you earn a skill point. And the damage you do increases incrementally by 1% every time. So the more you level up, the more you can upgrade your character, and the more damage you do. Some missions and some enemy types, like I said before, require a certain level to comfortably take them on. Otherwise, for some reason, it feels like you're firing champagne corks at them or something. And it's like their bullets are made out of fucking Valerian steel. Because they'll melt you in seconds. <laughs> Leveling happens pretty fast though once you start getting into the flow of things. And it does pluck on those neural pathways and brain structures by feeding you this constant sense of reward when you level up. What I think's neat too though is that when you're playing in co-op mode, the difficulty that you choose is separate to your partner. So you can be playing on very hard for instance, and if your buddy isn't as, as good at shooters as you are, he can bump his down to easy and you can still both reap the benefits. Team play is also pretty damn important. Between both of you, you've got three lives. Now how this works is that when someone gets down by an enemy, you can revive them if you're quick, but if they bleed out, they can get back up automatically, but you lose one of your three lives. If you lose all three of these, it's a game over, and it throws you right back to the start of an area. But they do give you the tools to help prevent death, like this weird pet mechanic where Jess or Soph can flash some devil's horns or a thumbs up, which gives both of you 50 health points. If both of you do it back to back, that's 100 health points in a matter of seconds. And yeah, you're gonna need it. Aside from the game using your Bethesda friends list instead of the Steam friends list, which is just stupid, inviting friends is also pretty easy. You can hop into someone else's game and all of your progress and your weapons gonna carry over into theirs. If you've unlocked weapons from later in the game, you can now even use these to access new areas. And it doesn't seem like you can really carry low level players either, because the areas are gonna have enemies that scale to your level. Sadly though, I had quite a few dropouts and lag issues when I was playing with other people, but this might have just been because the game was still pre-release, so I'm hoping it's since been fixed. Mostly though, it does seem like they've handled this co-op aspect pretty well. There's even the option of in-game voice chat, and again, you're gonna need it. And in terms of the shooting, look, I can't really fault it. I played the game on very hard, and aside from a couple of outright broken boss fights, the combat felt pretty good and balanced. This is a big improvement from the new Colossus, where you'd often get blindsided and melted by even the weakest and the lamest of enemies. Speaking of the new Colossus, Youngblood really is so different tonally, and it does seem a bit out of place with the rest of the series. Cigarette. So you had the new order, right, which felt like this very dark and gritty story, trying to show the atrocities of war and dealing with themes like torture and genocide. The old blood went for the schlocky route, being very self-aware, throwing zombies and ancient monsters at the play, but doing it in a fun and a cheesy way. 
the new Colossus felt like it didn't know what the hell it wanted to be. At times it tried to be dark and serious, but then other times it used humor in a way that felt awkward and forced. And it wasn't sure if it wanted to use violence as a deterrent or a punchline. Youngblood, on the other hand, ignores all of that. And it feels like the video game equivalent of Cindy Lauper's Girls Just Wanna Have Fun. Things start off kind of serious with BJ and Anya trying to tutor their daughters for this inevitable upcoming war against the Nazis. But then after that, when BJ disappears and Jess and Soph head off with their friend Abby to find him, it turns into this wacky adventure where these doe-eyed young women steal a chopper and fly into Nazi-occupied Europe to start killing bad guys because it's something fun to do. I mean, the cinematic where the girls kill their first Nazi is played for laughs where the premise of blowing someone's head off and having their brains get in your mouth is something to poke fun at. Which is fine, I mean, I laughed at it, but it's just showing how vastly different in tone all these games are. Oh my god. Oh my god, I got his brains in my mouth! It also lacks a real antagonist for the majority of the campaign, which doesn't help either. My biggest problem with Wolfenstein 2 though was that it seemed to favour cinematics over gameplay. You'd play through a section in that game for about 15 or 20 minutes, but then you'd have to sit through another 5 or 10 minutes of cinematics after that. And I felt it was this really bad cycle of storytelling and gameplay that I found very jarring. Youngblood on the other hand is the complete opposite of that. So the game opens with about 15 or so minutes of cinematics, which helps to set things up a bit. Then after that you've got a couple of the introductory missions before a few more cinematics, but then that's pretty much it. Once you reach this hub area and can start tackling all of these main and side missions, you don't get interrupted at all, pretty much the entire time. You can just run around to your heart's content without having to watch a cringy cutscene showing characters trying to artificially interact with each other. And I think honestly, in the entire game, there can't be more than maybe seven or eight lengthy cinematics. Out of the 12 hours it took me to finish the whole thing, I'd say 11 of these, if not more, were spent shooting things, which is the way it should be. But here's the 411 folks, and I think the biggest problem, and that is that you really have to play this thing in co-op mode with a friend to get the best experience out of it. And playing it without a friend is like playing an entirely different game. It's like trying to play foosball solo or to try to dutch it yourself. One of the main reasons is some of the spongier enemies in the game, like the big robo hounds and the super soldiers. Ideally, you want to play with someone who can help you coordinate attacks on these tougher enemies, or else it can be a real pain in the ass. The reason for that is that these bigger enemies have weak spots, usually on their backs. So you really need to have one person distracting the enemy from the front, so the other person can sneak around the back and hit that weak spot for massive critical damage. And coordinating that by yourself in solo play is just not possible. And this is, I think, why they've included health bars on the enemies. Kind of helps you to determine at a glance what kind of threat that enemy poses. And you can also tag that enemy and both focus fire on them at the same time. Bit of a shame that you can't tag items or anything like that either. But being able to tag enemies, even if it is only one at a time, really does help. The other issue is that the friendly AI doesn't seem to be capable of stealth, like, at all. Just seemed that when I played solo, the other character would just start going in guns blazing all the time. And that's not very handy when you're going into an area that's got three or four of the toughest enemy types that are all just patrolling around waiting to kick someone's shit in. So them's the breaks. And I mean, if you haven't got someone to play this with, well, you should really consider if it's worth your hard earned dollary dues. But where it matters the most, the shooting is pretty damn good. And when you're able to just run around and shoot Nazis, shit is tight. Still, look, they ain't getting entirely off the hook. And I still think there's a bunch of weird stuff they put into this game. Like, I still find it really odd how enemies can survive an entire magazine from an assault rifle to the face, but throwing a knife at them from 50 meters away is going to kill them in a single hit. Oh, and there's kamikaze dogs in this game. Yeah, German shepherds with explosives on their back that run up to you and fucking explode, because that's now a thing for some reason. Oh, bitch, get out the way. I also had a lot of issues getting this game running in the first place, because it just kept crashing before the main menu, and that was a royal pain in the ass. Once I got into the game, it seemed pretty stable and it ran pretty well. And I think I had maybe two or three crashes in the entire time I played it and a couple of disconnections, but nothing too major. But I don't understand why every single game in this series so far has just had such a crappy launch when it comes to optimization and stability. I think the new order in the new Colossus took me about 20 or so hours to get through. But this thing took me around, like I said, 12 hours. They have kind of priced it right though, coming in at around 50 bucks. 
The deluxe edition is 70 bucks, but all you're getting for that at the moment is some cosmetic skins, which are about as useful as a cock flavored lollipop. What's probably the saddest though is that the game's gonna come under a lot of flack for its microtransactions. And putting microtransactions in a game in 2019 is like drinking gasoline then pissing on a bonfire to try to put it out. Look, microtransactions are stupid, but at least the ones in Youngblood are cosmetic only. And I think spending money on something like that and then complaining about it's like sticking your hand in a mousetrap and complaining your finger hurts. But I do think Youngblood is worth playing. If you've got someone to play it with, then only then because otherwise liberating Paris is gonna be one empty, lonely experience. See, one, two, three. 